colleagues, th uh, welcome again. Uh, oops, sorry. To this session, and uh, um, I'd like to uh, focus the next couple of minutes on this whole area of uh, the impact of the pandemic on this uh, vaccine information ecosystem or the information ecosystem in countries. And we've seen how that has impacted the work that we do and also the impact and going back to many of the conversations that we've been hearing from the time we started yesterday, uh, we saw how it has impacted a lot of areas of work that we are involved in. So, uh, a second, let me figure out how to move this. Yes. I'm not going to go through uh, the definition of a pandemic, I think, it, uh, or infodemic. I think that uh, is something that we are all very well aware of. And, but it drives a lot of the work that we're doing right now. The fact that we've seen such an increase uh, in uh, the amount of misinformation and vaccine negative content that the world has seen. Uh, I think there was over three times the negative content in messaging in um, uh, in the 2020s that we saw before the pandemic. And a lot of this content actually was, I mean, 15 billion of this, uh, the views were seen in this content in March 2020. One of the things that we also saw is a lot of this misinformation or the negative content was driven in certain languages and it was the English language that actually uh, took precedence in driving a lot of this negative content, a lot of it born actually in the US as well. Some of the studies that we saw uh, show that, you know, the Im immense increase in vaccine negative conversations over that period of time. Uh, we s also saw the regulation changes that took place in terms of, you know, uh, uh, the misinformation uh, following, say, for example, what happened in Twitter, where they took out the regulation uh, of moderation of the content. And then we saw a huge explosion of uh, negative vaccine negative content uh, that was going on. We also saw that a majority of the misinformation was still related to COVID. Uh, but of course, there was a lot of uh, content that came up on HPV, polio, and also now we see a lot of conversations that are going on on RSV as well. Misinformation, we've also seen how it has impacted and influenced behaviors. Vaccine misinformation has had real consequences on the work that we have done. In a multi-country study that was done, um, we saw a strong association between perceived believability of COVID-19 misinformation and vaccine hesitancy. Higher incidence of influence of misinformation in low middle income countries. But of course, there is also conversely an ability to detect misinformation may also be associated with higher vaccine acceptance. So this was something that, you know, so, uh, I'll give you an example of something that we are working on now. It's called, uh, uh, you, I mean, it was, it's a game that was introduced. Uh, it was a game called Cranky Uncle. We're working with the inoculation specialist, uh, uh, Professor John Cook in, uh, he was Monash earlier and now I think he's, he's in Melbourne University. And he came up with a game uh, called uh, using inoculation theory to uh, vaccinate people against misinformation. And we worked with him to come up with a game uh, which is on vaccines itself. So his original game was on climate change related misinformation. So there was a whole big analysis done on the fallacies used uh, and the tactics used for vaccine related misinformation and the game focuses on building the skills of the players to identify misinformation so that they are stronger in, be, uh, in being able to uh, address misinformation. And uh, I mean, we've seen fantastic results in the pilots done in Uganda, Kenya, uh, Ghana, and uh, Rwanda and Pakistan are just going into their pilots. Uh, some of the countries that have completed the pilots are now going to scale with the game itself. So. Uh, we've seen that 
you know, really building that skill in the players to try and identify what misinformation is helps them even more to handle misinformation themselves. So, uh, Santi, one of your questions about working with young people. This is one of the things that we, you know, a majority of the target audience for Cranky Uncle Vaccine Edition are young people, but they're the ones who are literate in terms of digital uh, platforms and all that. We're also looking at how we can uh, address the issue of equity because the question of, oh, how many people have actual access to a smartphone to play the web-based game or the app. So we've diversified it into many other platforms. There, Ghana has diversified into a voice platform uh, and a chatbot. We have a print version of it. We are also using it on another app, uh, which is a zero-rated app called the Internet of Good Things. So COVID-19 pandemic and the accompanying infodemic have negatively affected vaccine uptake. And all of us have seen some of this taking place. Lisa alluded to some of this data in her presentation a little while ago as well. However, the pandemic has had both a positive and negative effect on vaccine acceptance, depending on the context of the vaccine itself. So we've seen how uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has caused disruptions in vaccine services and has had varying impacts on vaccine acceptance with, you know, both the positive and the negative uh, effects depending on the context that we were talking about. If you look at this next uh, study again, it was something that was done uh, fairly recently. And I'm sorry and apologize for the American uh, context that is uh, quoted here, but this is something, the reason that we brought this into the slide is because of the fact that what the study saw was that adults with highest trust in their healthcare provider had the highest confidence in MMR, at least, uh, and least concerns about the side effects. So you can see that in any context, if there is trust, and uh, I think yesterday in the keynote address as well, Lisa was talking about this issue of trust. We saw in many of the presentations today as well that trust is going to be a key indicator going forward. Uh, whether it is trust in your source of information, whether it's trust in the information itself. Uh, you'll see this slide in Saad's presentation. This is some of the work that we've been doing with Yale and, uh, uh, and uh, some very successful results coming out of that work in many of the countries that we were able to work. But let me just focus on two of these boxes that I've circled here. The box where we look at uh, the whole issue of disinformation and then the trust issue. And I'd like to focus a little bit on the next slides on these two areas. So the COVID-19 pandemic has led to some new determinants, as well as increasing importance of previously existing determinants. So some of these determinants are things that we did focus on in the past, but through the work that we did, we also saw that there are new emerging determinants that we had to focus our attention on. So these two, the disinformation that we have already talked about, and trust are two key determinants that uh, drives our work. Uh, the trust in foundation of vaccine demand and the pandemic has brought this into, you know, a real focus of all the pandemic preparedness indices, only high levels of government and interpersonal trust, as well as less government corruption was associated with higher coverage of COVID-19 vaccine. And we saw how this impacted in many countries across the world. Lack of trust in health professionals and low confidence in domestic and international health institutions was cons consistently associated with COVID-19 vaccine hesitancy. And we saw uh, how, um, uh, I mean, I was working in uh, Kenya during the time of the pandemic, and we saw initially how there was such a lot of resistance to uh, vaccination due to several things. And this was also going back to what Janet was talking about in terms of not seeing the impact of the pandemic in the country. We were dealing with highly populated populations and areas and they didn't see the disease. So they were like, you know, what are you talking about? Yes, you're showing so many people dying on the streets in so many other countries, but we don't see it here. So there's no disease here. 
So that whole area of not being able to see it, the fact that we were then promoting the vaccines and I mean, being um, uh, conscious about the people who are the most highly vulnerable, the initial audiences that were targeted in Kenya were the healthcare workers for the vaccine. And they were like, you know, up in arms saying, you know, you're testing it out on us. You know, why are you giving it only to us? And I think what changed, I think I saw it in, was it in the Philippines or the Indonesian example? What really changed the way that people looked at it was a public appearance of the president, the minister of health, the wife of the president, the religious leaders like the, uh, the bishops and the Islamic religious leaders, everyone publicly taking the vaccine and it was telecasted right around the country. And that really helped to change the way people trusted this vaccine. Uh, of course, there were many questions like in uh, Indonesia, I said, was that really the COVID vaccine that the president was given or was it a B12 injection? So there was a lot of questions that were asked subsequently, but still that really changed the way people started this thing. And then you saw the lines appearing in all the vaccination sites uh, of people really wanting to take the vaccine. Uh, we live in a noisy information environment and are constantly receiving information through different channels. We saw that in all the presentations that we were talking about. Uh, and how we experience information, whether it is offline or online, is, you know, our ability to access these sources, uh, the, our levels of literacy, uh, the social norms and networks that exist in our communities, and the language that is used. We saw that when we were introducing Cranky Uncle, we did uh, um, uh, co-creation workshops in the countries. But, and I uh, uh, distinctly remember when we did it in Rwanda, we had uh, a younger age group people playing the game and giving us feedback. We had healthcare workers playing the game and giving us feedback. And we also had uh, uh, parents, older parents playing the game. And the younger people were so good at playing the game. You know, they were leveling up very easily. We didn't have to give them any instructions. But the parents were like, you know, okay, so what do we do now? Which arrow do we press to go to the next level? How do we move to the next level? So that digital literacy itself is going to be a challenge. And that's why we were looking at other platforms to use. But uh, these are some of the uh, uh, issues that affect the way we experience uh, the information that is out there. Uh, whether it is online, we also again go back to the fact that are we connected online? Are we on X or Twitter or whatever it is? So do we have, someone was asking me, how do I get connected onto that little bird type social media platform? There's a little bird on it, you know, how do I get connected onto that? And I was as ignorant as that person was. I'm so uh, it's also about that whole literacy thing from, you know, do we have access to the internet and all that. So, and that's why, you know, we're looking at working on this thing called the Internet of Good Things, which is a zero rated uh, site uh, where people don't have to pay for data to access the information that is on it. Literacy skills, whether it is, you know, in terms of the language that is used, forget about language in terms of understanding the language itself, but the type of words that is used, do we even understand that? Are we being, you know, very medical in our terms and giving uh, very high flown conversations that are taking place? One of the key things that we look at is, you know, when we look at uh, focusing on the information ecosystem, that it is not only about just listening, but, you know, looking at what are the questions that come from the community, look at what their concerns are look at the information gaps that exist. Uh, what are the misinformation conversations or trends that are taking place? What are the disinformation that is taking place? And one of the other things that is very key is, uh, I think, uh, was it Liz who was talking about it yesterday when uh, during dinner? You know, it's not about downloading something from Talk Walker and saying, oh, we are doing social listening. But uh, looking at conversations that are taking place online, offline and at community level. How do we triangulate all these conversations and then try to bring it together and then develop our insights? 
yes, then um, uh, we do develop the insights reports. Then what do we do with that insights report? Is that channeled to the communication people so that they can now respond to all these questions, concerns, or the information voids that exist? Uh, what does a healthy information environment look like? So you, people will need to have access. They need to have awareness. People need to know uh, where to seek and find credible sources of information. In some countries, I think uh, Liz was working with me during that time, and we were doing a search of uh, uh, looking at country Ministry of Health websites to see what type of information is available on this supposedly credible source of information. And in most countries, we saw there was hardly any vaccine-related information. There's this picture, there was one country, and listen, I laugh about it, you know, because there was one country where the, the vaccine site uh, of the Ministry of Health had four gentlemen wearing suits looking at a cold chain piece of equipment. And that was all there was. You know, so if people want to get information and if they can't find it, they're going to find it in non-credible sources. So unless we are proactive and providing that information up front, they will find it from somewhere else that is not credible. So uh, the literacy level of the people, people understand the health information. So it's not only about ability to read, but it's also the ability to understand what you read. Amplification, you know, who shares uh, this information and where is it available? Uh, the whole area of trust, influence, you know, who do we use to influence this information ecosystem? Who do people accept uh, as important and what do people accept as important preventive measures uh, in countries? I mean, we, when we were talking about social distancing initially during the pandemic and I was working in Kibera, people live in a little box of a whole family uh, and they used to laugh at us and say, you're talking about social distancing, where would we sleep? You know, we're sleeping on one on top of the other, you know, and you're talking about the importance of social distancing so that we can avoid getting infected, you know. It's not possible. Uh, so some of the work that we are doing to support the countries. So we have a social listening and misinformation management strategy, which is built on three main pillars. The first pillar, which I've highlighted, is the pillar that talks about the information environment and the uh, nature of a, how to build. And we are helping countries at the moment. We're doing a lot of training at the country level for country level partners to improve that information ecosystem at the country level. Uh, so some, uh, you know, uh, I work in a discipline called social and behavior change. And I see that many of you in this room are also in that same discipline. And understanding, you know, where the root causes of this under vaccination, the context that comes on and designing the content and responding to these insights that we have identified. Testing, and this is something that was done uh, with SADS uh, teams in the, the applying things that the business or the commercial marketing world was using, like A-B testing onto our social issues. And we were able to do randomized control trials with huge audiences uh, using those principles and testing out the type of messaging and messenger that was being used that works for country context. Uh, by looking at the key principles of effective vaccine communication. So it's not uh, talking in a vacuum, but looking at tying up the theory, the science into the work that we are doing. And one of the things, uh, I don't know, Saad, I haven't seen your presentation, whether you have this, but probably you might have some of these slides, you know, gain framing. One of the things, I think yesterday uh, during uh, Lisa's talk also, I think Lisa, you were mentioning about, you know, providing a, a, a reason uh, for the action that you want people to do. So gain framing is something that we were, we really looked at, you know, providing, uh, not only the terrifying message, but then providing a uh, uh, reason, like, for example, this is something from India, you know, choose vaccination for a healthier tomorrow. Uh, use vaccinations uh, or vaccinate your kids so that the kids can play, study, learn and all that. It's not about focusing on the death and the disease and the uh, disfigurement of having the disease or whatever it is, but it's also giving them a reason as to why. 
So I'm not going to waste too much time on this. This is uh, some of the work that we were doing, you know, where we really were able to reach huge proportions of audiences through the work that we did. So things like, you know, focusing on self-efficacy, focusing on value-based uh, approaches. Uh, really helped in the countries. We saw how we uh, did in Argentina, for example, where they focused on one of the biggest issues that they had was uh, the fact that fathers were not getting involved in the vaccination process of their children. And how do you talk to the father and make sure that he was going to get involved? What triggers or what hooks can you use to move that father into that process? So using something, someone that influences his decision uh, was something that we really saw uh, that worked. Uh, social listening and tracking analysis, synthesis of conversations on the specific topics can help uh, detect important signals and uh, shifts in conversations and common concerns that are existing at the community level draws on multiple information sources to reach conversations. So this is what I was talking about earlier, not only focusing on the online, because that is the easier way of getting information, but how do you look at conversations that are taking place at community level and bringing it up into your analysis? Uh, and um, making sure that the results are actionable in terms of the insights that are generated. Oh, let me move on, I know. So uh, some of this, this, uh, the frameworks that we are using is making sure that, you know, we prepare, uh, the, and this is some of the things that we are doing right now. Uh, our team is now right now in Egypt. They were in Timor last week or the week before uh, doing the same type of work where they help the Ministry of Health to prepare, to build that team, to build that skill in the country, to be able to do the work. You then talk about how they are looking at the listening component, you know, to build and detect the conversations that are taking place and maintain the, the, the conversations, you know, where do they log it? How do they look at it? And then, of course, the analysis part, you know, how do they look at understanding what is being said? How do you respond to that and what do you do with that information? And then the strategic conversations that take place, how do they then tie it up? Uh, we saw during the pandemic countries coming up with fantastic insights reports. It was very well done, beautifully laid out and all that, but it just was an insights report because it never got channeled to the people who are actually doing the communication response. So how do you tie that loop and close that loop, you know, making sure that they say, making sure that the people who are not only generating the insights, but also responding to communication have a seat at the table. You know, sometimes in countries, we don't have health promotion making the decisions. You know, they don't even sit at the table. How do you make sure that they are part of that conversation and the decision making process? What is also important is the mapping the ecosystem. And these are things that we already spoke about. It's nothing new, but you know, where does the conversations take place? How do they take place? And what are you going to be doing with that insights that comes out of it? Some of the resources that we've developed over the years are the vaccine messaging guides. And these are things that we've done in partnership with Yale, in partnership with PGP and, um, and also Facebook as well. Uh, vaccine misinformation management field guide. Recently, we launched a co-publication, a joint publication with WHO, with Tina's uh, old tier team on uh, how to develop insights reports, the last one that we have there. Uh, and this, uh, it's now going to be available in Spanish and French very soon, probably in the next couple of days. Uh, we'll launch uh, those two language versions as well. Uh, this is just a snapshot of the training that I was talking to you about at the country level. So it's very in-depth. We'll take them through the different stages. The first one is looking at the whole information ecosystem, strengthening their capacity to do that. And then we start talking about misinformation and social listening and addressing misinformation, etc. So in summary, understanding the information gaps, questions and concerns and misinformation that exists within a vaccine conversation has helped us to address them in a strategic and effective way. We should be, uh, we should, by producing and sharing credible, accurate vaccine content that is also compelling and responds 
to specific communities and needs is very critical. You know, why is, uh, yesterday we were talking about it, why does Coca-Cola who just sells a bottle of colored water with sugar, uh, so that's my time. <laughs> uh, uh, so uh, colored water have so much share of mind when they're just selling something that is not even good for your body. And here we are selling something like vaccines and people don't even listen to us and we have such trouble trying to, uh, to influence someone's vaccine decisions. Why is that? It's probably the way we are saying it. You know, we have this, uh, with all due respect to the doctors in the room, we'll have a doctor wearing a white coat with a stethoscope around his neck who can't even communicate properly who is mumbling, who says vaccines are important. While as Coca-Cola has young people jumping out of waterfalls and skating and doing all these wonderful things and with so much color, music and sound, obviously people are gonna get attracted to that message than my life-saving message. So how do we change the way we communicate so that we have that share of mind? Uh, is something that is very, very important. Vaccine decision making, you know, and how it influenced a wide range of factors that can differ from time and context. I like the fact that Lisa was talking about the different determinants. You know, usually when there's low vaccine uptake, immediately the fingers are pointed to us, demand folks saying, what is demand doing about it? You know, and we heard also uh, earlier about the fact that, you know, supply may be the biggest issue. You know, it could be that people don't have access to it or people don't have... so. Looking at all the determinants that affect that decision-making process is something that we need to look at. We must understand what drives vaccine decision-making in the communities we seek to engage and to be able to respond through social and behavior change uh, approaches. So that's something that is our bread and butter and that is something that we really need to focus our attention on. Uh, and I think I've come to the end of my, this thing I have, I think three minutes uh, for questions, if there is any questions.